Okay, for the first four class sessions, we've been talking about federal taxes. We're not done with taxes, but we're done with federal taxes. So now we're going to talk about, in one class session, all of the state and other taxes that apply to nonprofit organizations. Um, the goals for this class session, I want you to be able to explain the property tax and the charitable exemption. I want you to explain the sales tax as well and the charitable exemption for that. There are actually two of them. Uh, and finally, I want you to be able to explain the various employment taxes and withholding requirements. And it, this includes being able to distinguish between an employee and an independent contractor. There's a lot of misconception out there about what constitutes an employee versus an independent contractor, and that matters for tax purposes as far as a nonprofit employer is concerned. So let's talk about the property tax. Uh, all 50 states have a property tax exemption for charitable uses. So if you're a nonprofit and you're using your property in a charitable way, then pretty much every state will give you exemption from property tax for that purposes. In fact, most states either permit it in their constitution if the legislature chooses or the, the, the constitution requires it. Um, and so whether or not it's in the constitution, most states have statutes clarifying and establishing the exemption. So let me give you the example of Utah. Utah's constitution says that, that a type of property exempt from property taxes is property owned by a nonprofit entity used exclusively for religious, charitable, or educational purposes. Well, so the Utah legislature, in its wisdom, passed a statute clarifying what this, mean, what this constitutional provision means. And in the, in the, in the Utah state code, Pro property tax exemption includes property owned by a nonprofit entity, which is used exclusively for religious, charitable, or educational purposes. Now, I read that to make it sound like the which is phrase is really important, but it's not at all. Basically, the legislature essentially fully ratified in the code what was already in the Constitution. I'm not even sure why they needed to do that, but there it is. So essentially, in the state of Utah, if you are a nonprofit and you use your property exclusively for religious, charitable, or educational purposes, then you don't have to pay property taxes on that property. Now, this is interesting because I want you to notice that the IRS definition, right, the federal definition of charity, already includes religious and educational. So it, it brings up the question, well, is the, is the, is the Constitution and the, and the state code, are they just being uh, redundant, right? Because if charitable already includes religious or educational, then what's the point in mentioning them? Well, the, re the reason those are in there is because those aren't necessarily considered religion and education are not necessarily considered charitable under the under the state law. In fact, a really important case that was decided in uh, um, the state of Utah in the 80s was Utah County versus Intermountain Healthcare. And let me tell you about what that was. In, in this case, um, uh, Intermountain was uh, obviously operating in Utah County and doing it with a lot of really valuable property. Um, the Regional Medical Center near Provo is a big facility. It's on prime real estate, and and Intermountain doesn't have to pay any taxes, property taxes for that property. Um, so uh, Utah County said, "Hey, you know what? Intermountain is getting away with." with way too much um, freedom here. They, they should be paying property taxes. There's all kinds of support that we have to provide them, and they're not paying for any of it, so they decided to sue uh, Intermountain Healthcare and said, look, they're not a charity. They, uh, they're they simply a business. Um, they're a nonprofit, but they're not a charity as far as the Constitution is concerned. Well, so um, Intermountain defended itself by saying, look, we are a charity. Look, here's our tax exempt status from the IRS. They call us a charity because healthcare is considered charitable under the tax code. Well, this case went all the way up to the Utah Supreme Court and the Utah Supreme Court actually cited in favor of, of, sorry, of Utah County. And they said, you're right, Utah County, Intermountain Healthcare is not a charity under our, our law's definition. So they, they essentially refused the federal definition of charity and said, as a state, we are entitled under the federal legal system, right? Because we have, diff we have entity states and the federal power and they're separate and they said we're going to define charity our own way and just providing health care for a fee is not charitable as far as we're concerned charitable care means caring for the people who can't the needy and so on and uh, and intermountain hasn't proven that they have done that and so we're going to impose a property tax 
So that was the Supreme Court ruling. Well, I, Intermountain Healthcare didn't have anywhere higher to go because this was a state law issue. And so instead what they did is they said, all right, let's change our strategy. They went to the state tax commission and said, look, under this new definition of charity, we are a charity. And what they did is they showed all of the free care that they provide to people in need. They showed all the community education that they provide in terms of health education and and other services. And they pointed to all these other activities saying, this qualifies for a charitable exemption. And they said, more importantly, all of these services that we provide out of our own pocket outweigh the property taxes that they, that we would be paying if we were not considered charitable. The idea is that the charity is that the charitable assistance they provide is greater than the property tax they would be paying, and that charitable assistance is a community benefit. And so, um, and they also kind of threaten, saying, if we have to start paying property taxes, we can't afford to do all of this charity care. Well, the state tax commission was persuaded by that and decided that they weren't going to impose property taxes anyway. So even though IHC lost that case, they didn't lose the war because they were able to persuade the state tax commission to give them property tax exemption anyway based on this other standard. Now, that doesn't mean that they just sort of got away with something. They have to continue providing charity care, and they have to keep doing it at amounts higher than they would be paying in property taxes. That's how the state tax commission justifies it. And so if you go to the Intermountain Healthcare website, you can find their community um, support uh, report that they produce every year. And in this report, they talk about all the public services that they provide. In fact, in 2011, which is the last time I looked it up, um, they provided $175 million in charitable assistance to Utah residents. And so that is a lot of money, and it's a great community benefit. And so that's the justification for what happened. But what's important is that this case, the Utah County versus Intermountain Healthcare case, became uh, nationally important, and it was a justification for states across the country to question charitable tax exemption ignoring the federal definition and adopting their own definition. And that's been the prevailing approach ever since this case. Um, what does the, so if you're going to be exempt from property taxes as a charity, there are two elements of the law that you have to satisfy. And the first one is identity of ownership and use. The charitable organization has to own both, has to both own the property and use it. So you can't rent property as a charity and claim tax exempt status, nor can you own property as a charity and rent it out to somebody else and claim tax exempt status. The charity has to both own the property and use it, and the use has to be what the law considers actual use. So the property has to be an actual charitable use, not just held for other purposes. For example, the LDS Church has a bunch of property all over the state. In fact, in some very well-developed neighborhoods, there are big empty lots without any sign of ownership, no intention for development. People are wondering, why why have houses never been built here before? Those property, that, those, there's a good chance that that lot belongs to the to the LDS Church, and the church is holding on to that in case they ever need to build a church facility, and that's why they don't sell it so other people can build houses. Now, the thing about these these uh, big empty lots is they're not engaged in actual use, so the church should be paying property taxes on those lots, uh, even because they're not using them for a religious, educational, or charitable purpose. Once they build a church there, then they no longer would have to pay property tax on it. The uh, property tax exemption for charities is pretty controversial, and it's repeatedly controversial. In fact, in some states, it's a hot-button issue constantly. Um, And it's because of these reasons. First of all, local governments are forced to forego revenue or raise rates on everybody else. Right, because if the if the local government needs revenue to cover all to provide all of its services, then uh, then the uh, they have to make up for it by charging everybody else more. So the fact that the LDS Church doesn't pay property tax on everything it owns or Intermountain Healthcare for that matter, effectively drives up our property taxes for all the rest of us. Um, that or the other alternative is, of course, is to cut services, and uh, that's usually not very popular either. The other thing, another thing is that charities enjoy free public services as a result of this tax exempt status. When the police are called to respond to an LDS church building, um, the church hasn't contributed to that. They haven't paid in to the property taxes that fund that protective protective service. The same is true as if the fire department responds. The same is true about our streetlights being turned on. 
Um, even though they benefit from those services, they don't support them or provide revenue for them, so they're basically free. Um, finally, uh, <clears throat> one thing, another thing that makes this controversial is that often unpopular or commercially inclined charities strain the public approval. Um, Intermountain Healthcare is an example of this. It's kind of commercially oriented, but um, but uh, it still gets its tax exempt status. Um, you know, if a Planned Parenthood showed up, it could probably justify tax exempt status as well um, from property taxes, and that would probably make a lot of people in Utah mad. Um, and and you know, if it went the other way politically, it'd be true too. Um, you know, we we create kind of a big tent, and if you get inside the tent for charitable tax exemption from property taxes, then that's it. But, you know, not everybody loves that, and they're frustrated when that happens. But the truth is, in spite of this um, sort of free pass, a lot of localities have figured out ways to get their money anyway, and they do it by by um, trying to get the charities to pay what are called pilots or silets. So a pilot is a payment in lieu of taxes, and a silet is services in lieu of taxes. And these are both basically agreements that the nonprofits make with the local governments saying, well, because we don't pay property taxes, we'll make these payments sort of voluntarily. But they're not always really voluntary. In fact, I want you to think of this as something like um, mafia protection money. Because basically what happens is the city will show up and say, boy, this is a nice nonprofit you've got here. It'd be a shame if somebody challenged your property tax exemption in court. And then the nonprofit says, well, what do you mean? And they say, oh, no, we don't mean anything by it. We just mean it'd be a shame if somebody took away your property tax exemption through court order. You'd spend all kinds of money defending that claim, wouldn't you? And then the nonprofit says, uh, what do we do? And the city says, I'll tell you what, if you come to an agreement with us that you'll pay some money anyway, even though right now you're tax exempt, if you pay some money anyway, we'll promise that we won't sue you to challenge your tax exempt status. Now, if that sounds like a shakedown, it, it kind of is. In fact, Philadelphia is famous for this because they are ready and willing to threaten a great number of nonprofit tax exempt statuses in order to get their revenue from those nonprofits. A lot of cities don't do pilots or silos. Instead, they charge, start charging user fees and special assessments. Technically speaking, under the law, these are not taxes, and so they become popular alternatives. So instead of saying we're going to tax you to support our police and fire services, they just say we're going to charge a fee uh, for everybody who wants to benefit from the police and fire services. Now, if you think that sounds a little crazy, how could... You know, for example, if my house is burning down and I didn't pay my fee, does that mean the fire department wouldn't show up? Well, that actually happened. I think it was in Kentucky. And uh, the fire department showed up, but they didn't put that fire out in the house. In fact, the only reason they were there is because they wanted to make sure the fire didn't spread to other houses in the neighborhood. Where And these are other people who had paid for fire service through their user fee. So... Um, anyway, so you can't mess around with this. And as a nonprofit, you need to pay those fees. All right, let's talk about the sales tax. The sales tax works, um, it also allows for a charitable exemption in two ways. Um, the first way is the tax on the charity seller. Now, what you may not realize about the sales tax is that as a, as a, as a purchaser, you don't actually owe the tax. It's just that the, the government allow, the state government allows the seller to pass the tax on to you as long as they itemize it on a receipt. But ultimately, the tax burden belongs to the seller. The seller doesn't even have to pass it on to you. They just can't raise their prices in a hidden way to accommodate for the tax. And, and you occasionally see this. So there will occasionally be stores that have a sale, like a tax-free day. Um, they're basically saying, we're going to eat the cost of the sales tax um, if you come into our store. Really, it's just a 6.5% sale that they're having. Um, but... Uh, but ultimately, it's the but they still have to pay the tax to the state government um, for the sale, even though they didn't pass it on to you. <clears throat> so charities that sell things, as long as they sell them in the course of their charitable purpose, um, then they don't have to pay a sales tax. And so when you go buy your bo textbooks from the BYU bookstore, you may have noticed that you don't pay a sales tax. And the reason you don't is because the uh, uh, the bookstore is carrying out a charitable purpose. And in the process of carrying out their cha that charitable purpose, um, they don't have to charge you a sales. They don't have to pay a sales tax to the state, which means they obviously won't, don't charge you a sales tax. And so charities that are selling things as part of their religious or charitable activities, they don't have to pay a sales tax on the things that they sell. But sometimes, like we said, ta sales taxes get passed on to the buyer. 
Well, the IRS has exempted charitable buyers as well. So as long as the purchase is made in the conduct of the charitable activity, then um, then the charity doesn't have to pay that sales tax either. And there are two ways you can avoid it. You can avoid paying a sales tax by um, by sort of prearranging it with the store. And so if any of you have bought things, for example, in a church calling where, where, the, where your ward had an account, um, they don't charge sales tax up front. And the reason is because they've sort of prearranged the fact that you're tax exempt from the sales tax. And they don't bother charging it when they when you make the purchase. The alternative, however, is if the if the seller is not giving you this tax exemption up front, if they're charging you a sales tax, then you can file for a reimbursement from the state later. And so if you've ever so if you've bought something for award activity and then when you filled out the reimbursement form you had to identify how much you paid in sales tax, that's because the church keeps track of all those sales tax amounts and then they add them all up and they give copies of receipts and they file a claim with the state tax commission and the tax commission sends them a big fat check reimbursing them on all those sales taxes. Um, that's uh, <clears throat> that's basically how sales tax exemption works in, in not only in the state of Utah but pretty much every other state. Okay. So last we're going to talk about the employment taxes and other withholdings. Um, every employer has to pay employment taxes, and they're imposed both at the state and federal level on these sorts of things, usually to fund Social Security, Medicare. They also charge, they also require employers to, to do income tax withholdings from paychecks. That's not a tax on the employer per se, but they, it's an obligation on the employer to withhold income taxes. And, uh, and also every employer has to pay for unemployment insurance, which isn't a tax per se, but it has the effect of a tax by forcing all the employers to buy into unemployment insurance policies. And that, the, basically the way unemployment insurance works is uh, the employer pays into the fund and then, or into the insurance policy. And then when somebody makes, a, and then if one of their employees gets laid off and makes a claim, then the insurance, the unemployment insurance is what pays out the unemployment claims. As far as employment taxes are concerned, all nonprofits with employees have to pay employment taxes. And so in, in particular for Social Security and Medicare, if, um, if you're employing people, then you're paying a little over 7% of their salary to the federal government or the value of 7% of their salary to the federal government in the form of an employment tax. And then the other 7, a little over 7% is taken out of the employee's paycheck to pay. So you sort of split the difference. If any of you have paid self-employment taxes, you pay a little over 15% um, because you don't have an employer that's covering your employment taxes for you. Some states, including Utah, allow charities to self-fund unemployment insurance. So a lot of local governments will do this or other really big entities. And basically what they do is they pay a bunch of money into an un unemployment fund. And if somebody claims unemployment, um, then it's drawn down. The, those claims come out of the fund for that's been self-funded. Uh, finally, workers' comp insurance is a legal requirement in all states, but it's not an employment tax per se. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's just that if somebody makes a workers' comp claim, you have to have an insurance policy that will pay that claim. Now, this all presumes that we're talking about employees, and so you should be maybe thinking to yourself, well, this is easy to avoid. I'll just make every, I'll just treat everybody as an independent contractor because if I treat them as an independent contractor, then I don't have to pay employment taxes for them. But not so fast. You can't actually do that as easily as you think. Um, an employee is not a contractor just be, just because you say that she is. The IRS and also state governments consider three principal factors to evaluate whether or not the person really is an employee. The first one is behavioral control. How closely does the employer control the worker's activities? If you control their activities very closely, then the odds are that person is an employee. And the reason is because if you sort of manage day to day the types of things that they do, then it's not really independent, right? I mean, part of being an independent contractor is being independent. What that usually means is the employer says, hey, I want this outcome. You go make it happen however your, your judgment tells you to make it happen. Whereas with an employee, you tend to say, hey, you know, I want you to do this today and do it this way, answer some phones. When you answer the phone, say this and so on. And so those people are actually where you have lots of control over their behavior. The IRS is going to consider them an employee. 
The same is true for financial control. If you have a lot of control over the workers' compensation, for example, if you pay them on a biweekly schedule, a fixed salary, or an hourly rate, if you don't provide bonuses like or commissions, um, if you make 401k contributions or you do like uh, health insurance withholdings or health insurance deductible payments out of their paycheck, that that's, exhibits a lot of financial control. So the pro- person is probably going to be considered an employee by the IRS. Um, whereas with an independent contractor, you know, it might be a person where they paid 100% commission or even most of their salary comes, most of their income from you comes out of a commission and the commission may not have upper limits so they can make lots of money one month, a little bit next, right? And you don't do any of the other extra stuff like retirement, uh, you know, contributions or, or health insurance uh, deductible payments. And so... <clears throat> not deductible payments, sorry, premium payments. And so you get the idea here, right, that if if you don't have a lot of control, then they're an independent contractor. If you exercise lots of control like you would with an employee, then the IRS is just going to say, hey, this person is an employee. The type of relationship matters. It matters how the employer and worker perceive their relationship. For example, do they work in an industry where that's dominated by independent contractors? You know, that's true of all kinds of professions like accountancy, law, uh, medicine, um, uh, consulting, right? These are all industries where, where the people who work for clients are usually doing it as independent contractors. Sales is another one. Um, but then there are other types of activities where the people are actually more commonly considered employees, right? And that would be like a program officer for a nonprofit. And so um, a, a receptionist who works at the front desk, um, you know, a, a, an HR rep. Um, these are the kinds of jobs that are generally dominated by employees and not independent contractors and also just how do they perceive the relationship like does the does the worker consider themselves an employee but you call them an independent contractor the IRS is going to say that that matters too now why does any of this matter well the reason is because we live in a world where we want employers calling their workers employees when when you treat a person as an employee it creates more stable tax revenue for the federal government, it creates a more uh, stable economy without people being cut off all the times for no reason. Um, It just, employment versus independent contractor relationships promote stability, and that's generally what we want. So let's do a little quiz. Could the following be an independent contractor? Well, the first one, an employment agreement requires that the worker complete a regularly provided list of tasks in a manner that the employer describes. That sounds like a lot of behavioral control, so we're going to say, no, they're not an independent contractor, they're an employee. Next one, the worker is paid on a biweekly schedule based on hours worked and receives no performance-based compensation. That's definitely an employee, right? Because that's how employees get paid, not independent contractors. And then finally, the worker performs an essential function to the company in a provided office facility and receives benefits in addition to regular compensation. This sounds the type of relationship that would be an employer-employee relationship, so we're going to say no to that one too. We'll talk about this more in class. We can discuss more examples and answer your questions, but just remember overall that a person is not an independent contractor just because you say they are. All right, we're done with this class session. See you all in class.